So you know how in the modern era of Spider-Man comics, we're kind of blessed with a treasure trove of captivating narratives, a feast of beautifully crafted stories that are meticulously woven with intricate plot lines and rich character development? I fucking hate Paul! Yeah, well believe it or not, there was once a time where Spider-Man's adventures were shrouded in darkness, plagued with lackluster storylines, stagnant plots, and underdeveloped characters that absolutely went nowhere. Although I know we're all just in rejoice over the fact that the days of the shallow storytelling and the one-dimensional characters are over and done with, I'd still like to bring us back in time just a little bit so I could share a story with you from that era. First and foremost, I just want to say that this is absolutely one of my favorite Spider-Man comics of all time. I love the black suit, I love the artwork, I love that Daredevil is in it. Need I say more? Let's get right into it. It's a tale about the death of Jean DeWolf and also serves as the introduction to the villain known as the Sin Eater. This comic was published in 1985 and was written by none other than Peter David who has written some pretty damn good Spider-Man stories. I'm not too knowledgeable about his work outside of Spider-Man, but according to some people on Reddit, they said he's done some pretty good work on other stories such as Aquaman, X-Factor, and The Incredible Hulk. Oh, and he also created Spider-Man 2099, so like... That's pretty cool. The comic in front of us starts off with Jean DeWolf's life flashing before her eyes as she is sprawled out on the floor, fatally shot. We get a little bit of insight on what Jean DeWolf's upbringing was like. She recalls her troubled family history with her father abandoning both her and her mother when she was just a baby. Her mother, scarred by the past, swore off relationships with law enforcement officers until she met and married patrolman Carl Weatherby. Although Jean developed a deep affection for her stepfather and aspired to be a police officer herself, her mother always feared the day she would receive news of Carl's death in the line of duty. Despite her mother's disapproval, Jean enlisted in the police academy and eventually became a captain, hoping to earn Carl's pride and approval. As her life fades away, Jean hears a pounding at her door and police officers discover her lifeless, blood-spattered body. And then immediately following that, we have Pervert Parker here taking pictures of some random woman just being a total fucking creep, saying that he's going to put her pictures up in his dark room. Like, what? And then, boom, baby, Ernie Popchick shows up. Let's fucking go. Peter and Ernie just randomly start talking on the street, and Ernie just starts telling him that, like, he's going to cash his social security check, you know, and go shopping in the city. And Peter's like, ah, oh, don't wave that wad of cash around, you know? And then immediately after that, Ernie gets fucking jumped. Peter sees this shit. And he's like, okay, I'm doing something. He puts on his black suit and kicks some fucking ass. We actually see on the next two pages that Peter exhibits more force than usual due to their assault on Ernie. One of the criminals actually gives up and tells Spider-Man to unclench his fist, and he just straight up fucking clocks him. Police show up, and you can actually see the guy Spider-Man just punched on the ground, begging for him to stop. The police inform Spider-Man that Ernie is okay, but he is being taken to the hospital for observation. They ask Spider-Man if he's heard about Gene DeWolf. He tries making a joke without knowing the reason behind the question, and is left in total shock and disbelief when the officers tell him that Gene DeWolf has been murdered. On the next page, we see a man confessing his sins to a priest. We also see J. Jonah Jameson and Joe Robertson discussing Gene DeWolf's murder. I love these moments in the comics where Jonah actually feels like a real person and not somebody just in place to shit on Spider-Man. Jonah is deeply disturbed by the fact that Jean DeWolf was brutally murdered, and regardless of his personal feelings towards her, he says that no one deserves to meet such a gruesome fate. Joe inquires whether Jonah's sentiments extend to Spider-Man as well. In a candid moment, Jonah confesses that while he firmly believes that individuals such as Hitler, cop killers, and assassins deserve their rightful demise, Spider-Man does not fit into those detestable categories. Before their conversation can continue, Reverend Tolliver enters the scene, embarking on a mission to establish a new parish in the bustling streets of New York City. Seeking recognition for his noble cause, he humbly requests a mention in the esteemed Bugle publication. A flicker of recollection illuminates Jameson's mind, reminding him of a tale involving Tolliver and a series of gruesome slayings in Atlanta. His unforeseen connection between them sparks a fleeting exchange regarding race, prompting the priest to gracefully offer his apologies for any unintentional offense caused. In desiring answers, Spider-Man visits the police station to speak with Sergeant Stan Carter, the investigator in charge of the case. Sergeant Carter actually assures Spider-Man that he is not a suspect and shares Gene DeWolf's high opinion of the wall crawler. The next two pages, we just have Daredevil doing cool Daredevil shit. Why is my voice cracking? I'm literally a grown man. 
Matt Murdock switches out of his Daredevil attire, and he prepares to represent his clients at trial in the criminal courts. Peter, Aunt May, and other boarding house tenants observe the proceedings. Peter becomes frustrated when the thieves are released without bail. I actually love this page so much. Matt Murdock actually senses that he's talking to Spider-Man here, and I just think that's really fucking cool. Peter actually gets upset at Matt for defending the criminals. Matt doesn't say anything here, but later on when the courtroom empties, Matt confides in the judge about his inner conflict when defending criminals. I actually love these pages here as well. Matt senses the Sin Eater from like a room over, and he wanders on into the room anyway when the judge leaves. I just absolutely love when he inner monologues about his senses. He even tries reasoning with the Sin Eater, mentioning his blindness and profession as a lawyer. However, the second he learns that Matt is a lawyer, he takes fire. Matt narrowly evades the bullets and uses his billy club to strike the Sin Eater. Sadly, before Matt can warn the judge, the Sin Eater turns and shoots him. The second part of this comic starts off with a flashback from when Matt Murdock was back in law school. Matt details a memorable encounter that he had with Judge Horace Rosenthal. After attending a guest lecture by Rosenthal, Matt approached him to express his gratitude but also pointed out an error in one of the case studies presented. Judge Rosenthal advised Matt to speak up during the lecture instead of afterward, emphasizing the importance of courage and authenticity for a lawyer. This marked the first meeting between Matt Murdock and Judge Horace Rosenthal. Fast forward to the present and tragedy strikes as Judge Rosenthal is shot and killed in his office by the Sin Eater, which was witnessed by Matt Murdock himself. Fueled by a determination to avenge his colleague's death, Matt storms out of the courthouse and transforms into Daredevil, resolved to find the killer. Nearby, Peter, Aunt May, and Ernie are distressed over the release of the men who attacked Ernie. Ernie questions the judge's possible bias against war veterans, fearing that the streets will become unsafe. Suddenly, the appearance of the Sin Eater fleeing down the street throws the surrounding people into a panic, disregarding his assurances of causing no harm. Amid the commotion, Peter separates from Aunt May and Ernie. In my opinion on this page, Peter handles this very irresponsibly. He knows that there is a gun-wielding murderer running around, and instead of stopping him immediately, he tries to make a couple jokes. Due to his carelessness, a couple bystanders actually get shot by the Sin Eater. The sight of the bystanders getting hit horrifies him, especially as he fears for Aunt May's safety. Spider-Man manages to web the Sin Eater's gun shut and engages in a battle with him. During the fight, Spider-Man realizes that the Sin Eater is the one who killed Gene DeWolf. I love this page. I love when the people in New York are cheering for Spider-Man. It's fucking dope. Oh, and he also looks like a complete menace at the bottom left. Spider-Man gets distracted by the fact that the Sin Eater had Gene DeWolf's badge. This distraction actually causes Spider-Man to get his ass beat. You can also see just how insane the Sin Eater actually is. Spider-Man gets pissed off by this and hits him with a wham. During the fight, Spider-Man's attention is diverted when he sees Aunt May lying on the ground, leading him to worry for her well-being. Exploiting the distraction, the Sin Eater escapes as Spider-Man tries to stop him, only to discover that his web shooters were damaged in the confrontation. Spider-Man attempts to tag the Sin Eater with a spider tracer, but the killer notices it and removes it. With the Sin Eater successfully fleeing, Peter reverts to his civilian identity and rushes to Aunt May's side. Thankfully, she is unharmed, but Ernie scolds Peter Peter for not being by her side the entire time. This to me sums up what the Parker luck is, however modern comics will have you believe that it's him just being constantly fucking shit on. Daredevil arrives at the scene realizing he was too late to prevent the shooting spree. Daredevil details that there's too much noise and too much confusion for him to pick up on the Sin Eater's heartbeat. The Sin Eater watches Daredevil as he escapes on a passing city bus. The following day, Spider-Man visits Stan Carter, who informs him that the gun used to kill Judge Rosenthal matches the one used in the murder of Gene DeWolf. Spider-Man expresses his desire to assist, driven by his failure to stop the Sin Eater. Stan then goes on to ask Spider-Man if he knows what a Sin Eater is. While in some superstitious societies, like in the Ozarks, they leave their recently deceased laid out with fruits or edibles on their chest, and a man comes whose only job in life is to eat those fruits, which represents the sins of the deceased. Once he eats them, the deceased soul is cleansed, ready for heaven, courtesy of the Sin Eater. Except our guy is killing people, and then takes tokens of his victim's authority with him, since the items would be associated with the sins. On this page, we also learn that Stan Carter was a former member of the S.H.I.E.L.D. The web had requests to investigate Jean's apartment, but Stan declines, aware that it would draw criticism from fellow officers. Spider-Man then asks Stan what his partner's opinion would be on the situation. He discovers that Carter's partner was killed in the line of duty six months ago, and Stan personally brought their killers to justice. On the next page, Stan implies that he would turn a blind eye if Spider-Man chose to investigate the apartment. Meanwhile, a bespectacled man returns to Reverend Finn at a church, confessing his sins once again. He shares his struggle with hearing voices that urge him to commit terrible acts. I'm just going to throw these next two pages on screen and let you read them because I really don't know how to commentate over them. 
when I first read this comic and I saw these pages, I was kind of blown away by the thought of Gene DeWolf even liking Spider-Man. I just think that could have been a really cool relationship dynamic to have them together. On the following pages, we see two separate funerals. One for Gene DeWolf and one for Judge Horace Rosenthal. At Gene DeWolf's funeral, a very sad scene unfolds as Gene's grief-stricken mother places the weight of blame on her stepfather for the tragic loss of her daughter. We see Matt Murdock attending Judge Rosenthal's burial. As the attendees slowly disperse from both services, a heightened sense of awareness grips Matt as he keenly detects the distinctive heartbeat of the Sin Eater. Among the fading echoes of grief and solemnity, his finely honed senses tune into the pulsating rhythm that sets the Sin Eater apart. A surge of determination courses through Matt's veins, propelling him to uncover the truth and confront the enigmatic figure responsible for the turmoil surrounding both funerals. Unfortunately for Matt, the abundance of people surrounding him poses a challenge for him to be able to pinpoint the exact identity of who the Sin Eater is. In a moment of resolve, Matt Murdock reaches a decision that he can no longer conceal the crucial knowledge that the killer lurks within their midst. Determined to protect everyone, he musters the courage to sound the alarm, intending to warn the gathered crowd. However, as fate would have it, his revelation comes too late. The space around him is empty, leaving his words unheard and his intentions unrealized. Meanwhile, Peter Parker finds himself sharing a ride home with J. Jonah Jameson. A somber atmosphere envelops him as he reflects on recent events. With unwavering determination, Peter makes a solemn vow to himself that Spider-Man will not rest until the Sin Eater is apprehended. Aware of the ticking clock, he sets a clear deadline of 48 hours, resolved to bring justice and closure to those affected by the sinister acts committed by the elusive murderer. The final page of this comic has us returning back to the church. Unaware of the man's true identity, Finn advises him to follow his convictions and do what he believes is right. Moved by the advice, the man loads a shotgun and opens fire on Reverend Finn, revealing himself as the Sin Eater. I fucking love the cover art. The comic opens up with news of Reverend Bernard Finn's murder at the hands of the Sin Eater. The media ponders what the media ponders who might be the next target. The media ponders who might be the next target. The media ponders who the next target might be. Among the deceased are Captain Jean DeWolf, Judge Horace Rosenthal, and Hugo Kelsey, an innocent bystander caught in Spider-Man's clash with the Sin Eater. Learning of this, Peter blames himself for dodging the Sin Eater shotgun blast and engages in a phone conversation with Detective Stan Carter, assuming his alter ego as Spider-Man, discussing the latest developments in the case. Detective Carter remains unimpressed by Reverend Tolliver's interview about the Sin Eater. Marla Jameson, J. Jonah Jameson's wife, watches the news and decides to invite Betty Leeds to stay with her while Jonah is out of town, feeling unsafe with the Sin Eater on the loose. Reverend Tolliver... Reverend Tolliver also watches the news, feeling satisfied with the speech he delivered during his interview. Emil Gregg, who frequently made confessions to Reverend Finn, laments as the reporter mentions authorities' concerns about potential copycat killers. Lastly, we see Matt Murdock listens as the reporters transition to a story about a series of burglaries on the east side. Meanwhile, on the east side, a young girl awakens to a knock on her window. To her surprise, she finds Santa Claus standing outside and asks why he's visiting before Christmas. Santa, actually a man in a Santa costume, promises to explain everything if she lets him in. It is later that same night and another fat man, who's hardly jolly, dictates into a small recorder. The letter is for C.B. Kalish, someone who has been inquiring about becoming the Kingpin's next assassin. Displeased with Kalish's assault on his men as Madame Fate, the Kingpin dismisses her and warns her against interfering in his affairs again. Aware of Spider-Man lurking on the ceiling, the Kingpin fires his cane ray at the hero, but Spider-Man manages to evade it. The Kingpin informs Spider-Man the same thing that he told Daredevil earlier. He knows nothing about the killer. He expresses indifference towards the deaths of DeWolf and Rosenthal, but objects to the Sin Eater targeting a priest, as it polarizes the city and makes control more challenging. The Kingpin allows Spider-Man to leave through the front door and advises him not to incapacitate any more guards, suggesting he learns subtlety from Daredevil. Across town, we see Matt Murdock in his civilian identity visiting seedy bars to gather information about the Sin Eater. However, the rough patrons attempt to attack him. Matt easily defeats them, and when they back down, they claim ignorance regarding the Sin Eater. As Matt leaves, the bartender expresses relief that no one has broken the window. That is until our boy jumps through the fucking window, let's go! Spider-Man kicks everyone's ass, but fails to find any useful information. Spider-Man continues searching the city for leads, but he comes up empty-handed. After leaving a voicemail updating Stan Carter on his progress, Spider-Man changes his tactics. He visits the home of a drug dealer named Gerald Jablonski and forcibly takes him from his house. Spider-Man brings Gerald to a shady bar, hoping to extract information from him. Nervous about being seen talking to the wall crawler by other criminals, Gerald admits his involvement as a middleman in drug deals but claims ignorance regarding the Sin Eater. The next day, Peter visits the Bugle to check if they have discovered any leads on the Sin Eater. 
Just when he arrives, the senator storms into the newsroom demanding to see J. Jonah Jameson and taking Marla hostage. Thinking quickly, Peter throws office equipment at the gunman, knocking him out. They unmask the assailant, revealing him to be Emil Gregg. Peter believes he has apprehended the real Sin Eater. Later on, Peter shows up as Spider-Man and he attends Gregg's interrogation, during which Gregg confesses to the crimes fully. <laughs> Sick. However, Daredevil enters the room and requests a private conversation with Spider-Man after listening to Emil's confession. Outside of the interrogation room, Daredevil informs Spider-Man that Greg is lying. Spider-Man inquires about Daredevil's source of knowledge, but Daredevil hesitates to reveal his ability to detect heartbeats and detect lies. Nevertheless, he convinces Spider-Man to accompany him to Emil's apartment to investigate the crime further. Inside the apartment, they search for evidence to determine if Greg is indeed the Sin Eater. Daredevil takes the opportunity to reprimand Spider-Man for coercing Jablonski into confessing his involvement in drug dealings. While searching, they discover a locked door that has recently been picked. Opening it reveals the neighboring apartment. They proceed to search the second apartment, where Spider-Man finds bills addressed to Stan Carter. Initially shocked to learn that the killer lived next door to the detective assigned to the case, Spider-Man's shock is intensified when Daredevil uncovers a secret storage room containing spare Sin Eater costumes, a shotgun, and a tape recorder. The evidence strongly suggests that Stan Carter is the Sin Eater, while Emil Gregg, although mentally disturbed, confused the records as voices in his head. Realizing that J. Jonah Jameson is likely the next target, Spider-Man frantically contacts Joe Robertson to obtain J. No, 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 no. Realizing that J. Jonah Jameson is likely the next target, Spider-Man frantically contacts Joe Robertson to obtain Jameson's phone number. He then calls Betty to warn her about the Sin Eater, but arrives too late as the Sin Eater has already broken into the apartment. Spider-Man urgently tries to alert Betty to escape, but the Sin Eater opens fire, blasting a hole through the chair she was sitting in. As Betty Leeds faces the imminent threat of the Sin Eater, Spider-Man and Daredevil rush to her rescue. Spider-Man reflects on his past relationship with Betty as his first love while fearing that she may have already been killed by the serial killer. At J. Jonah Jameson's home, where Betty has been staying, we see the Sin Eater standing in front of a chair with a gunshot hole in it. Thankfully, Betty had managed to evade the shot by hiding under the desk. The Sin Eater is surprised by his missed shot and attempts to strangle Betty with a shotgun when he discovers her affiliation with Jameson. Gasping for breath, Betty questions the Sin Eater's motive behind the murders. The Sin Eater reveals his reasons. J. Jonah Jameson for opposing mass vigilantes like Spider-Man, targeting Reverend Finn for his stance against capital punishment, Judge Rosenthal for being lenient on criminals, and Gene DeWolf simply because he felt like it. As Betty struggles for survival, she grabs a letter opener and stabs the Sin Eater in the leg. Before the Sin Eater can harm Betty any further, Spider-Man crashes through another window, prompting the Sin Eater to throw Betty at him in order to buy time to reload a shotgun. Spider-Man seals the shotgun's barrel with webbing and disarms the villain. Engaging in combat, Spider-Man unleashes his anger upon the Sin Eater, fueled not only by the murders but also by Stan Carter's deceit, pretending to be Spider-Man's friend. Daredevil arrives, intervening to prevent Spider-Man from killing Stan. However, Spider-Man refuses to back down, leading to a clash between the two heroes. They continue their struggle outside onto the street, arguing about their differing approaches to fighting crime. Spider-Man's blind rage allows for Daredevil's heightened senses to overpower the web-slinger, and he is knocked unconscious by Daredevil. Reflecting on the aftermath, Daredevil wonders if Spider-Man's intense emotions are clouding his judgment or if he himself doesn't care enough about the case. After the arrest of Stan Carter, the press swarms in to investigate Betty and Marla Jameson, sensationalizing the danger they faced. As the revelation of Carter being a police detective becomes public knowledge, the public is outraged and other officers anticipate potential backlash. At a bar, patrons discuss the police covering for each other, echoing the sentiment. Elsewhere, a young boy is told to go back to bed when found at his apartment window. The boy contemplates how surprised his parents will be when Santa Claus returns with a new television he traded the old one for. The next morning at the Daily Bugle, Peter Parker informs J. Jonah Jameson about the capture of the Sin Eater and how Spider-Man saved Marla's life. Jameson's anger subsides upon hearing this news. Meanwhile, Peter receives a call from Aunt May, who expresses concern about their tenant, Ernie Popchick, who left the house after the Sin Eater news with his old service pistol. Peter assures Aunt May that he will keep an eye out for him. Overhearing their conversation, Joe Robertson assigns Peter to take photos for an article about public opinion on the Sin Eater. At that moment, Ernie Popchick is on a subway train, and he's reading the newspaper, and he still feels unsafe in the city. When some young men harass him for money, Ernie panics and shoots them, fleeing the train afterward. The news of Stan Carter's transfer to Rikers Island is leaked, leading to discussions between Police Chief James D'Angelo, District Attorney Blake Tower, and S.H.I.E.L.D. Agent. And a S.H.I.E.L.D. Agent. 
The agent reveals that Stan was a test subject for S.H.I.E.L.D.'s drug research and development division, which involved injecting him with substances like PCP and Angel Dust to study their effects. Stan's paranoia and violent behavior toward authority figures escalated during the program. Despite believing that the drugs had left his system after retirement, recent events pushed him over the edge. Blake Tower faces a public relations nightmare and their meeting is interrupted by an angry mob protesting outside the police station. Spider-Man arrives and photographs the scene, while Daredevil joins him on the rooftop, leading to a disagreement about their crime-fighting ideologies. The police deploy officers in riot gear to control the crowd during Stan Carter's transfer. A full-scale riot erupts, led by Carl Weatherby, Gene DeWolf's stepfather. Daredevil tries to stop the riot, but Spider-Man initially refuses to intervene. However, when Daredevil is overwhelmed by the mob, he calls out to Spider-Man. Reluctantly, Spider-Man swings down and fights off the rioters, rescuing Daredevil and preventing Carl Weatherby from harming Stan Carter. They ensure Carter's safety until the police disperse the mob and regain control. Afterward, Spider-Man is surprised to learn that Daredevil is deduced to secret identity. In return, Daredevil reveals that he is actually Matt Murdock. Peter finds it's hard to believe and suggests they continue their conversation in private at his apartment. In Peter's apartment, out of their costumes, they exchange explanations and viewpoints. Murdock gets Spider-Man to admit that he intervened in the crowd because Daredevil believed it was the right thing to do. Matt extends his perspective to emphasize that everyone deserves a fair trial under the law, including Stan Carter. Their conversation is interrupted by a phone call from Aunt May, who informs Peter about Ernie's actions and surrender to the police. Matt takes the phone and offers his legal assistance, promising to ensure that Ernie receives a fair trial. Finally understanding Murdoch's point, Peter agrees to have faith in the system when Murdoch reassures Aunt May. I'm going to be entirely honest, I'm not really sure why I made this video. I think I had more ambitious goals when it came to it, but when I started making the video, my idea changed. Also, this comic just kind of gave me a reason to finally make a video and introduce myself to YouTube. The video style and editing kind of shifted over the course of making this video. I didn't really intend for it to come out like this. It honestly had a way darker and more sinister tone to it when I first started planning. There will probably be way more darker comics for me to talk about that maybe I can tackle in a different way, but I think I like what I did with this one. I already have the next comic I want to talk about in mind, but I really don't know how I'm supposed to commentate about it. It is a fucking weird comic. Anyway, that's really it. I plan on uploading more Spider-Man videos, so if you like what you saw, consider subscribing, hit the like button, do whatever you gotta do, or don't. I really don't care, I can't control you. I mean, I do care, but like I said, can't control you. Alright, see ya. Also, this video should have been done like two weeks ago, but Premiere Pro sucks balls, so if anybody has any different editing programs that I can use, please let me know.